things I did to just not feel the pain Like drinking myself slowly down the drain Anything to fix me quick But getting high is what made me tear I couldn't quit I never thought that I would see the day I'd hit my knees and I would start to pray Suddenly I felt the spark That picked me up and led me from the dark Or could it be God? Of all the bridges burning, surrender was the only way to win. When I let go, my wildest dreams were out there waiting. I won't go back, cause life is on the mend. Broken is a place I'm. Welcome everyone to Time to Heal. My name is Pam Hemphill and I'll be your host tonight. On this show we're bringing the dark side of addiction into a whole new light. I want to share with you by starting off that the fatal prescription drug overdoses have actually surpassed car crashes as the leading cause of accidental deaths. Many of the overdoses, 36%, involve prescription opiate painkillers, which are actually the cause of more overdose deaths than heroin and cocaine combined. Also, I just want to take a moment to honor a very special man, Tim Ryan, who his motto is, a man in recovery, helping one addict at a time, who lost his 20-year-old son, Nicholas, to a heroin overdose. Nicholas has been fighting the battle of addiction since junior high school. Nicholas passed away this last Friday on August 1st. He will be missed by many. Our heart hurts with you, Tim. Tim started an opiate recovery group. Sorry, I'm sorry, I got emotional for a minute. Tim started an opiate recovery group in his hometown of Fox Valley to provide support for the opiate addicts. He's also a crusader who is trying to bring Narcon to his state. As quoted in the local newspaper by Tim, he said, who knows, Narcon could have saved Nicholas' life Friday. Again, our prayers are with you and your family. We honor you for all the work that you're doing to save lives. In one of my previous shows, I had a guest who was an addiction doctor. He stated, it's no longer a harm reduction problem. It's a death prevention problem. How many more beautiful people like Tim's son have to pass away? I'm so upset about this, that we've been battling over this issue regarding Narcon. What has happened when people are trying to save lives that this has had to become a fight and a battle? What a shame, it's insanity. Think about it. What if it's your daughter or your son who's addicted to opiates and they're overdosing in your home? Think about it, visualize it. What would you do to save their life? So today on, on this show, I've invited three guests who are on a journey to fight this opiate epidemic problem. I'm gonna start off here with my three guests and let them introduce themselves, and then we'll come back and share their own personal story of what they're doing to fight this problem in our community. I'm Melanie Curtis, and I'm the Executive Director of Supportive Housing and Innovative Partnerships, or SHIP, and we have a prevention program called Connect the Pieces that we're doing this work with. Welcome. Glad you're Thank here. Thank you. I'm Don Tennyson. I'm the founder of Raise the Bottom, a methadone clinic in Boise. I'm also the Executive Director of Bow Creek Bella Vista Residential Treatment Program. Welcome, glad you showed up today. Mm -hmm. 
I'm Michelle McTiernan Gleason, and I'm director of Connect the Pieces Recovery Wellness, and I work with Melanie Curtis. Oh, welcome. Glad you showed up too. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to start off by asking Melody if she could share her story and how she began on this personal journey fighting the opiate epidemic. Um, well, I'll give you a little background first. I've been working with people with addictions for the last 13 years, um, providing safe and sober housing, employment programs, and other programs that are needed. But in um, November of 2011, I had a big wake-up call. Um, I, most of the folks we were dealing with were recovering from meth addiction and alcoholism. Um, but I, in my personal life, had the experience of my youngest son, Mike. Um, he overdosed on prescription drugs. He had a combination of um, hydrocodone, benzo a benzodiazepine called Xanax, and muscle relaxers. And um, he basically stopped breathing. And he too, when you talked about Narcan, he too could have been saved with Narcan had we had that opportunity to have the training as well as the, the substance to, to give him. Um, but that, that part of the story made me sit back and really think about, um, you know, what am I doing to help stop this? Yes, I'm here and, you know, SHIP has been the village down the river where we've been pulling the babies out and trying to save them and giving them the tools that they need to save themselves. And it's like, that wasn't enough. It, it, when I lost my own baby down that river and, you know, one of the people that in the world that I would have wanted to save the most, it really created a, a time that I had to do a lot of reflection on a personal level as well as professional level. And so what I realized is, you know what, I needed to start a journey up the river to find out why all these babies are coming down the coming down the river and why we're having to pull them out and it was interesting I went into my training as, as a social worker I have a master's and I started doing um, research to find out what was going on and I was shocked and this was um, December of 2011 when I started reading and seeing about the opiate epidemic that was really happening because of overprescribing, pres you know, prescription painkillers. Idaho is ranked fourth in the nation for the misuse of painkillers. And so we have a big problem here. We're losing um, an Idaho citizen to drug overdoses every 45 hours. So we're losing folks left and right. We're losing, um, we lost my beautiful son who is, his picture is right here. He was a wonderful father, a wonderful son. He was an asset to his community. He, um, he worked for um, a local grocery store here and um, he had he would work at different sites sometimes and he had customers who sought him out and would actually go to the store he was working at and so that he had this following of folks who he because he understood that life is all about relationships and caring about people he knew when people needed a pat on the back or a hug or just you know or a laugh and so he, and he was so skilled at that so I mean he really has created a void in my life and many others too um, but I, I don't want to talk a lot about that loss because we need to step up and I don't want any other parent or child or brother or sister to go through the loss that that I've experienced and now Tim has experienced and Tim if you're listening to this I want you to know my heart is with you and I know the pain that you're going through and I just I want you to know that there are lots of folks out here that can help support support you because you you've just joined a club that none of us wanted to be a part of but we we are and so we need to stand together on that so um, one of the things in my research I found was that 70 percent of the people that use misuse prescription drugs 
are getting them from friends and relatives. So, you know, whether or not people are just giving them to folks because they don't really think they're dangerous because the doctors prescribed them and you didn't buy them on the street corner, you bought them at the drugstore, they are dangerous and they can be deadly. So we, we definitely want to make sure that we are working with people in the community, parents, grandparents, to, to actually educate them about what they can do in their homes to make our community safer. And so that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, because if we can stop that 70% of those drugs that are getting out there, we can definitely make our community much safer. Um, there are you know, other things that we're doing too. Um, I serve on a group called the Prescription Drug Abuse Work Group, which is actually um, a committee that is staffed by the Idaho Office on Drug Policy and there are a lot of decision makers like people from the Board of Pharmacy, Medicine, Nursing, Dentistry, the Idaho Medical Association, there are doctors that serve on it. Um, there's also, but one of the things that this group is working on right now is bringing legislation to get um, Narcan approved in the state of Idaho. And so I'm very excited about what's happening with that. And they're getting the folks on board that need to be um, definitely supportive of it. So, and right now, I know that they're looking at um, legislators to carry the bill, the bill forward, and I'm not sure where we stand on that, but, but there is movement, so I'm very excited about that. Because um, that, that could have saved my son, sounds like it could have saved Tim's son. I have friends that have lost children and the same thing, they could have been saved by that. So um, that's very important, but we, you know, we need to do a lot of different things. I mean, at the community level, one of the things I think that we really need to do is we need to drop the negative feelings when we hear words like addict or alcoholic. Mm -hmm. It's because what, you know, what science has proven, neuroscience and, you know, the, it, this is a medical disease and we don't treat diabetics like this, which also requires a, um, a big life change. Um, we don't treat um, heart patients like this either. And so we don't throw them in prison. We give them treatment and we give them long-term treatment that they have follow-up for a long, long time. So we've treated addiction like an acute disorder, like a broken leg. It's like, oh, you relapse, so we're going to send you off to treatment. And that doesn't, that and then, and then you're done, then you're magically cured. Well, that isn't how chronic diseases work. So people can learn to manage those systems and they can, they can get better. And one of the things that Michelle will talk about is some of the programming she's put together to help people make that, those changes. So anyway, we are, um, we joined a coalition called the Fed Up Coalition. And we went last year to the rally where we um, we basically shut down the government. No, not, not really. It was, that wasn't us, but it was shut down the day of our rally. And um, it it was a good opportunity because it was all of these organizations throughout the nation that have been started um, by parents that have lost children to addiction. And so we all are coming from that same club. We're working together to make the changes that need to happen. And so we are going to Washington and for the rally at the White House on September 28th. And we will definitely be there supporting Idaho. We have, we're taking, uh, we know with that five people for sure are going, so we're very excited about that. And, but we want, we realize that many things need to happen for change at the national level. Um, there's, we need to see, make sure that the FDA, who is charged with making sure drugs and it are safe, and they're not. They're approving um, release of new um, opioids. And um, for example, um, 
It's, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it. Do you know what it is? Zohydro you might be yeah, referring to, Z Melanie? Zohydro, which is an extended release hydrocodone with no um, other drugs like Tylenol and stuff in it. And so that, they approved that, and, and which was um, their advisory committee voted, I think it was 11 to 1 not to, because of the opioid risk of, of overdose and everything, um, but they went ahead and approved it anyway, without really considering, you know, what's happening in our communities out there. Um, one of the things I meant to mention earlier is, right now, um, opi prescription opiates are creating the heroin epidemic that we're seeing all over the country and yes right here in Boise Idaho we have it going on as well um, right now four out of five new heroin addicts actually started by taking prescription painkillers that that is huge this is what's driving the heroin epidemic and so we call it an opioid epidemic because we do not want the pharmaceutical companies to get off the hook if we only call it a heroin epidemic that somehow separates off the um, you know takes them out of the picture and no they're a part of the problem you know when we, you look back at history bear at bear actually created um, heroin back in 1913 mm -hmm. and that's after that people got addicted and so they actually took that off the market and it became illegal so there was history to look at to see what would happen with opiates so here we are in 2014 and we have we have Purdue Pharmaceutical who put Oxycontin out there gave the same the same tired story that oh this isn't addictive and and it is and it has created this epidemic while they turn money over hand over fist and that is wrong and so that and that's what the FDA should be protecting us from and they are not so that's one of the groups that we definitely are trying to um, to influence one of the other things we want to see is um, we do not want to have to view prescription or prescription drug advertising I mean it was I met a mother from eastern Idaho who actually had lost a second child to an overdose and he was addicted to Lyrica. And you know, every time he'd see the Lyrica commercial, that would trigger him. And so, you know, that, and I didn't even know that Lyrica was something people would get addicted to and would die from. So, you know, that we have to pull that. That needs to stop. There are only two countries in the whole world that allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise on TV and that is the US and New Zealand. So um, other countries certainly have a, a better idea of helping to stop that, you know, putting, planting that seed in people's mind about what drug they need because that isn't for them to decide and then, you know, lobby their doctor to get that pill. So there's, there's so much we can do and these are things that have to happen at a national level. There's also things we can do at the state level, obviously supporting the legislation around Narcon. And um, there's, you know, there's, there's just so much that needs to be done. So I hope people will join with us and be a part of this. Because, you know, I realize that fighting this might not be your priority at this time, and it wasn't mine until I lost my son and now, it's a priority because I don't want anybody else to go through this. So, anyway. So. <laughs> Sorry, cut that part out, but anyway. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm not crying yet. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, that's why I didn't want to tell my story yet because it's way too, it's all right. yeah. So, but you know, so th there's so much we can do and I don't know that I've been as articulate as I've liked to have been about it, but you know, definitely can go to our website, which is connectthepieces.org. 
Um, one of the things that we really want to start doing is bringing together parents who've lost children. Because my sense of having looked for resources is I didn't find resources that really fit what we experience. Because not only do our children get stigmatized and um, discriminated against, so do we as parents. Um, I know Michelle was saying earlier today that when we have when our child dies or, you know, or um, we don't get the casseroles and the thing, you know, those kinds of things that happen when, um, when somebody in somebody's family dies. We, we, people kind of shy away and, um, but you know what, we're part of this community too, our children are part of this community and we all need to come together and we need to be much more open and tolerant about um, that addiction happens. It doesn't mean somebody's a bad person, it means they have a disease. And we as a society have not dealt with that appropriately, so it's so important that we start to turn that around and create opportunities where people can get the support they need. And that's one of the critical things we're working on. Mm, thank so, you. Sure. Would you like to share what you're doing, what you're up to? Certainly. your journey. How did you get started? <clears throat> well, I have to say first, it's an honor to work along with you, Melanie, and mm -hmm. I'm so sorry for your loss. I've been in Boise for more than three years now, and time and time again come across total strangers to Melanie, and of course to myself, who knew Mike and speak of how he touched their lives. Um, it's been just amazing to, um, to know her. and to know Michael through her. So my journey began much or similar to Melanie's on a personal and professional level. Um, more than 20 years ago, I began working in a detox hospital for the formerly the Karen Foundation, now known as Karen Treatment Centers, um, as part of the nursing staff as a nursing assistant. And then I was um, personally and professionally um, uh, affected by the prescription drug epidemic. I have volunteered since then in the field and uh, a loved one very near and dear to me became addicted to prescription medications right under my nose. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't smell alcohol. I did, you know, the, the signs that I was trained to see and accustomed to um, personally and professionally just were not there. So when we experienced this in our own family, um, I began to seek answers. What is, this, what is this all about? And began researching the prescription drug epidemic. Um, Melanie uh, and, and SHIP, Supportive Housing and Innovative Partnerships, and Connect the Pieces became part of my research. I became aware of the work that she was doing. And um, I began volunteering with Connect the Pieces. And in, also in my own research as to what has happened with the prescription drug epidemic, how it all came about, um, I identified a, a nutritional component and became familiar with recovery coaching. And um, uh, that's how we've developed Connect the Pieces Recovery Wellness uh, Program. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit uh, in depth in, in a little bit. But I'd like to say then, through working with Melanie, Melanie contacted me and said, asked that I submit a letter um, talking about my experience with prescription uh, addiction. And um, I submitted my letter to a woman named April Rivero, whose own, own son, Joey, became addicted to prescription med medications and died of an accidental overdose. Mm -hmm. And it is in through writing those letters, we became aware of April's um, uh, a f membership of the Fed Up Coalition, and we realized that the mission of the Fed Up Coalition uh, is in alignment with our own. And their mission is to provide one voice to end the epidemic of addiction um, and um, overdose deaths attributed to opioids and other prescription medications. Um, and. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. You have to edit that out. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and anyway, that's how we became um, part of the Fed Up Coalition. And as Melanie mentioned, we're going to Washington, D.C. on September 28th. And we're calling for 
immediate intervention of the federal government to help end what the CDC terms the worst drug epidemic in U.S. history. Um, we would, uh, we have our platform, by the way, the Fed Up Rally platform available at feduprally.org and also on Facebook. So there's many, there's much more to our platform than we can cover here today, but we are calling for a moratorium, um, uh, prescription medications with the painkillers, opioids, uh, with the FDA until we can get a hold of this uh, epidemic. And we are hoping that to have our president acknowledge the epidemic, which we hope will then turn the tides as happened with the AIDS epidemic. Once the president acknowledged it, then uh, people became aware of it and we were able to make progress as, as we've seen today. So um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where I want to go from here. I apologize. No. Um, you could talk. Should about I talk about the get into our recovery, recovery wellness program? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, in getting back to what we're doing at Connect the Pieces, we have our piece is to provide solutions to those afflicted uh, with um, uh, the addiction, uh, the disease of addiction, chronic disease of addiction, and um, to provide recovery support services as well, which is what we do in our. Um, Connect the Pieces Recovery Wellness Program and the prevention component uh, is of course contained in the awareness that we um, share with our Recovery Wellness Program but specifically with uh, the Amazing Adventures of Pharmacist Phil which is our Children's Prevention Program. There is also a nutritional component there. Uh, we introduce the conversation um, about prescription drug safety uh, by first speaking about nutrition in a holistic sense and how f um, healthy nutrition food, nutritional foods are our um, most powerful natural forms of medication. And if and when we become ill and we have to go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes medications, then there are certain um, rules with regard to prescription drug safety that, that we encourage them to follow. And that uh, four specific is to lock up your meds, um, take as prescribed, do not share, dispose of your meds properly, and to use one pharmacist and one pharmacy. Um, there are, pharmacists are our most accessible medical providers, and um, using one pharmacist, they're familiar with your prescription medication needs and your medical history and are able to identify any issues that may arise that could avoid uh, some of the outcomes that we've already mentioned in terms of accidental overdoses. Thank you. And Don, how did you get started on your road to helping opiate addicts with their addiction problems? Well, I had been in the field uh, well, now I've been in the field for over 35 years. And uh, so I came from a traditional treatment approach, treating alcoholism and uh, other types of drugs. And uh, I, I just kept at it. In fact, I was reminiscing with Melanie. We have some history way back, and uh, we were talking about some of the good old days. And, and I was... Uh, caught up into that what I call cookie cutter treatment approach mm. and I was watching my own chosen field in my opinion do less uh, successful work uh, than I had previously seen and I was beginning to lose a little bit of interest in in my chosen field because I, I, I was feeling although we were involved with many of the same committees, I felt as though we really weren't staying in touch with what I call modern day addiction. And we really weren't uh, in touch with uh, approaches that were successful. And so uh, I, I ran into a doctor a few years ago by the name of Larry Stone. And Dr. Larry Stone truly mm -hmm. was uh, uh, Dr. Bob reincarnated. This doctor spent hours in emergency rooms trying to help the modern-day addict and often would talk 
uh, recovery programs to these patients and suggest they go here or there. And Dr. Stone and I were working together in another facility and he was telling me about opiate addiction and how his hospital emergency rooms were overrun with every Friday, Saturday, overran with uh, people seeking pain medications. And, uh, and so he asked if I would help him, you know, begin to start treating uh, people with this type of addiction. And I was resistant at first because I came from that traditional history. Yeah. And, um, and I went to a, a facility uh, with him uh, over in uh, Washington State. And the day I was there, it was a methadone clinic, which I didn't support. And the day I was there, um, uh, I was witnessing a patient who had been a patient in this clinic for quite some time and maybe two years, three years. And this was a relatively young man. Mm. And he was so excited because it was his last day to receive a dose of methadone. And that he was going on and on, that he was now free, uh, free from the addiction, and free also from the medicine that helped him become free from the addiction. And he had put his life together. He had a county job and he was married, and it, this was a success story. And I was so impressed with this guy that it began to change some of my views. And I began working more intimately with Dr. Stone. And he and I then implemented uh, one of Boise's first methadone clinics, and uh, that's called Raise the Bottom. And again, I was uh, watching these success stories over and over, and I became a believer. And uh, I'm so glad that, that Melanie talked about, you know, let's call it an opioid crisis, mm -hmm. because often yeah. we call it other crisis. Yeah. There's a street that many of my patients have told me that exists in Boise called Heroin Alley. But what they begin to tell me is how many of them ended up in that alley because of prescription medications. And they knew no other way out but to maybe use needles and heroin for the first time in their life because they could no longer get the prescription. I'm just so grateful that you had an open mind. Mm. We're going to come back in just a few minutes. We're going to take a short break because I want to pre present to you a short video called I Am the Face of Addiction, which was provided to us by Natalie Costa, producer of Behind the Orange Curtain, is that correct? That's correct. Followed by a beautiful song sung by my daughter, Jennifer of the Jennifer Breeze Band. And this song is dedicated to all those of you who are going to the Fed Up Rally in D.C. Every 19 minutes we lose one life in this country to a prescription drug overdose. I am the face of addiction. One out of five high school students have admitted to using prescription drugs without a prescription. Prescription drug addiction has been deemed an epidemic. Every day on average, 2,500 teens use prescription drugs to get high for the first time. I am the face. 60% of teens who abuse prescription pain relievers did so before the age of 15. Prescription drug dependency can lead to heroin addiction. Heroin produces the same high, but for a fraction of the cost. Most parents are in denial. They don't think that prescription drug abuse and addiction can happen to their child. Most teens experiment with prescription drugs found in their family's medicine cabinet. Prescription drugs used other than their intended purposes can be deadly. Prescription drug addiction knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter if you live on Park Avenue or on the park bench. 56% of teens believe that prescription drugs are easier to get than illicit drugs. Prescription drug overdoses have surpassed annual youth deaths by suicide, death by firearms, school violence, and car accidents. Driving under the influence of drugs has surpassed drunk driving for the first time ever. Every year, 23 million people need treatment from alcohol abuse and drug addiction. Denial is as deadly as the disease. 
If you think this couldn't happen to your child, you couldn't be more wrong. We are experiencing an epidemic. The vaccine for this epidemic is awareness and education. I am the face. 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 I am the face of addiction. I am the face. 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 I am the face of addiction. Parents, for the sake of your children, please get educated. Welcome back everyone. We've been discussing the opiate prescription overdose epidemic in Idaho with my guests Don, Melody, and Michelle. Sorry, <laughs> I had a blank spot there for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and start all again with you Don. Will you share with us some more things that you experienced and what, what do you think the changes that we need to see happen in the government level, opiate treatment. I'm excited to hear what Michelle is starting uh, an adventure here to go to the feds and 
and start uh, knocking on that door and, and we, we have we're just beginning and I used an analogy before that you know what an iceberg is the tip of an iceberg is all that you see above the water but below the water is a much bigger piece of the iceberg and that's what's going on with the opioid crisis what do you mean much bigger underneath well, there, we're just beginning, like in places like Boise, mm -hmm. to even recognize that we're in a new crisis, much bigger than the methamphetamine crisis. I've been speaking to people, they don't even know what's happening. Yes. yes, yes, many people don't. As Melanie had mentioned, you know, there are parents that, and, and as you mentioned, there are parents that have no clue what's going on because it's the kind of addiction that's easily hid. And by the time you do find the problem, it's often too late for them to stop on their own. I have patients tell me every day that what they hate is what they term dope sick. They yes. do not want to be dope sick. And that's what we call withdrawal. When they're in that withdrawal, they'll do anything to avoid that withdrawal. Is that the same with the prescription medication? It yes. is. Okay. And, it, and I've been told by patients that it might even be worse in many cases with the prescription than with heroin. And I've had patients tell me that they can fight off being dope sick from heroin much easier than they can mm -hmm. Oxycontin. And that's because you're dealing with a pharmaceutical drug that's made in a pharmaceutical lab that's much more potent, much better in many ways than street heroin. As you know, old school heroin, by the time it gets to the attic, has been stepped on, often cut with other uh, drugs so that they can make money. Not so with the Oxycontin, you know, not so with those kinds of painkiller uh, prescription drugs. And I also appreciate Melanie mentioning that we have to uh, educate a lot more, especially with pharmacies uh, who are involved with that process and may not know that they're involved with that process. Patients often tell me that they do what's called doctor shopping. Mm -hmm. And doctor shopping is when you have a doctor who becomes aware that you keep asking them for the Oxycontin prescription over and over. They say, wait a minute, we may have a problem here. I'm not going to prescribe to you again. So then they shop for another doctor. And I love what you said that using the same pharmacist, what a great idea. Because if they're using the same pharmacist, it's harder for them to doctor shop. Because, like in Idaho, uh, the Pharmacy board has a way of tracking prescriptions. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to different pharmacists or different doctors so, and nobody's checking with that record, then you can get away with it and continue to feed your addiction. My concern is there's thousands and thousands of modern day addicts, opioid addicts, who are dying needlessly that we could prevent in many, many ways. My concern today is that my chosen field is not doing a very good job with this modern day crisis and this modern day addiction. We have government agencies that don't support methadone. We have government agencies that don't support Suboxone. That's just a couple of what we call MAT, medication assisted treatment that can help the addict from being dope sick long enough for the experts to help that addict become free. And maybe in many ways, not even a maybe, for certain, saving their lives. Too many people are dying. As you mentioned earlier, it has surpassed fatal car wrecks. I mean, come on, let's wake up, at least in Idaho, let's wake up. Hundreds of people are dying needlessly because we're closed-minded, because we don't mm -hmm. accept a certain modality. I love to hang out with people like Melanie because she's been around a long time. I love hanging out with you. You've been at it 
yourself for quite a while. You see the real picture. Melanie sees the real picture. And, and it just it boggles my mind that even though we can see what's actually happening, many people still have the blinders on when it comes to treatment. I wish the experts or the people that are in charge of the monies, so to speak, would ask the people that are in the front lines what we think, what direction we should go. Because we're the ones that really know. We're in the front lines. But yet, that doesn't happen. So I commend these two for their march to Washington, D.C. They're saving lives. They're breaking down barriers in Idaho. She's always been a radical in the field. <laughs> yeah. and I'm just wondering, too, about the Good Samaritan Law. Um, that, unfortunately, the group, the Prescription Drug Abuse Work Group, has elected not to try to make that a part of the um, Narcan legislation. Um, you know, we do live in Idaho, it's very conservative, but I think it's critical that they're going to need to pass that because in order to, you know, you don't want somebody to save somebody's life or not save somebody's life because they're afraid of being arrested and going to jail because they were there and they called. Because that, that's another statistic, it's like 80% of the people that die from heroin or opiate overdoses die alone and that's because the people who are with them because they don't use alone usually so they they're abandoned by somebody when you know because they don't want to get in trouble and we've got to get past that and not prosecute people that do even if they're stoned even if there's there's um, substances there or paraphernalia they need to have immunity from being prosecuted if they help save a life because to me that's much more important than you know and you know because I would rather see us get people into treatment I don't think that people with addiction need to go to prison I think we need to keep them in the community and support them so that they can get better so, so. you're saying if they're overdosing and I'm using with you mm -hmm. using the Either and you call 911. I, I could be arrested for you, calling because I'm using with you. Yes. Is that a well, be, it, it beca right. I think some of us, I kind of understand, but I think some of us. Well, well that's how it's set up right now. Many states have passed what they call Good Samaritan laws, and that basically says that somebody who calls 911. You know, even if they have drugs on board or they have paraphernalia there, um, they're not going to be arrested it's because the goal is, is to get people the help they need. Um, I think we're still, you know, we're vacillating. I'm seeing, I'm actually excited about some of the things I'm seeing. We, the legislature passed, um, it's called Justice Reinvestment Initiative, and it actually um, they're talking about services in the community and not sending nonviolent offenders to prison, which I think would be good. I think they really need to go to treatment, with whatever kind. Um, definitely support medically, I mean, medicine-assisted treatment, because the, the data on it shows that it is successful. And so, um, you know, I, I remember going through that period, too, where it's like, oh, no, I'm not methadone. And I mean, but you know what? When I look at it from the perspective of losing my son or having him here and him being on methadone and hopefully getting better and getting off of it, getting off of it. Um, sorry. Your mic. Okay, it's right here. Oh, it's right here. And so I, let's see. So if I, if, okay. Go ahead. Oh, Keep if I, lost mine. okay, they don't need to hear me. if, you know, <laughs> when I look at it from totally a personal perspective to have my son be dead and gone and, you know, the heartache that isn't going away, even, you know, I'm in year three of processing this. Um, 
I would much rather him have tried something like methadone and something and having a chance because every morning he woke up there was a chance that he could make it and that's you know we wanted there's always a chance and always an opportunity if you wake up that day and he didn't that next day and he's gone and you know so here's a little boy who was the apple of his dad's eye that's growing up without a dad so anyway and a nana who doesn't get to see him but anyway i won't go into that that's a whole other (laughs) other area but yeah but that you know it is so critical that we join together because even though you think that your kids aren't aren't involved um you know it's so peer driven with children and young adults that they're doing things like they call them farm parties and the entrance into the party is medicine out of your medicine cabinet and they dump it in a bowl and then they just take it so they don't even know what they're getting and so even if something happens they're not going to be able to say to the EMTs or the paramedics oh they took this this and this so you know there's just things that are happening that are so frightening out there so we've got to um realize that our kids are going to do it mike was a mike was a guy that never got in trouble he you know he had a brother has a brother steve that pushed every envelope and tried everything and um so steve learned to cope with that mike was kind of i'm going to stand back and watch and see what happens to steve and he didn't get in you know he didn't get involved with that stuff he he actually injured um, himself in a sport and he was playing soccer and broke both of his wrists and through that process got addicted to the painkillers and so it was about a it was probably like a six or seven year process for him to get so bad and then you know I think he's just getting stuff from the doctor I'm noticing things are missing from my you know my medicine cabinet like after I had surgery and things like that and I was blaming somebody else and you know I mean I'm you know I don't know but those are the kinds of things that we as parents want to really pay attention to we if we have medication we want to lock them up that means with a key or a combination lock so that kids can't get them in it you know that's one of the things that's so critical it isn't your medication is not secure if you're just putting it in the medicine cabinet because people can come in and get it. We actually had a realtor who was on our board of directors who um, what basically they had to, he bought, a, we were making um, locking medicine cabinets for a while and he actually bought one to use when he did open houses because people would go to open houses and go through people's cabinets and stuff. So we're talking about, when we talk about being dope sick, it's like the worst flu anybody's ever had. And so they want anything they can do to stop it, they're going to do. And I can't say I'd blame folks in that situation. So, And many of these people are middle class, mm-hmm. successful people, uh, young men and women that don't have a criminal yeah, history. Like and uh, and you, so you, the, the, the attic has changed a little. The face of the attic has changed a little. Yes. Yes. Melanie had mentioned uh, in her introduction being a social worker, and I, I have to confess I never, <laughs> that I am too. Uh, I just okay. don't like to. I have a, a master's in social work. I don't often mention that because I, I, there was something different I, I used to pick on the social workers quite a bit. Oh, you know? there you yeah. go. And because, uh, uh, you know, I saw a lot of what I called professional enabling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. You know, to me, in, you know, being a social worker and, and looking at stats and looking at research in a way that social workers are taught, uh, there's not a bigger social problem in our country than addiction. Mm. I can talk about all the social <laughs> problems in our country it all goes back and to that. none are bigger than addiction. And I don't and I don't hear politicians talking about it much anymore today. Like we used to see they get on the platform and talk about we've got to do something about the drug problem. Uh, we're not hearing a lot of that because 
they've lost the war. And the crisis is bigger than ever. And uh, thank God we've got people that are mm -hmm. trying to step up to save lives, trying to educate the community. Uh, this is the, a bigger problem than we've ever dreamed. It's the biggest social problem. It's causing more death in our country than anything. Our prisons are full, breaking at the seams yes. because we figure uh, we criminalize it. Let's lock them up and put them away so we don't have to look at it. And that doesn't solve the problem. Or, you know, we, that if you look at the money, it's one of those things, if you, if you follow the money and look at where the money's going, Big Pharma makes a lot of money off of this. Mm -hmm. um, so does private prisons. Exactly. I mean, I'm totally opposed to profit making based on people's misery. And that, you know, that isn't helping folks. Exactly. I mean, we're not, we're taking them out of their community. So they lose that. They then have a double whammy of not only do they have addiction, now they have a felony. And that makes it extremely difficult to get jobs. And to be able to participate as full functioning members of our community. Not just jobs. No. Every, housing, they can't Yeah, housing. housing is is very tough. Yeah, felony, they can't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like we've made sure that we have this underclass, and that's not helping either. Because, I mean, then, you know, anyway. And it so violates all anti discrimination yes, laws exactly. when we behave like that as a society. Yes. And when you do come out of prison with that tag, and you have a serious opioid addiction, you can't go get help. You are, you are told by probation and parole, don't go over to the methadone clinics. So it's set, set up for failure? You're set up for failure. Uh, you can't get a job, mm -hmm. you can't, I mean, it goes on and on. Well, and one of the other things, I mean, that is so important in Idaho that we haven't done is the expansion of Medicaid would make funds available to send people to treatment. Right. And um, it has to meet standards that are set by um, the Medicaid program, which are federal standards, which are a high level. And that's one of the that's one of the things we really should look at because not only do we do housing, we have a, a, over a hundred beds of housing that we provide for folks in recovery, and it is so difficult that, to get them the basic services that they need. They can get some acute care through some programs, but. Once they're housed with us, they don't then meet the house, the homeless definition. So a lot of options are um, taken away as well, and so they can't even get basic kinds of care. And so if we're if people are sick, and you know, and we're not doing anything to help them get better, that that creates a sickness in our community that's bigger and you know I just it's so hard to watch and know that you know the people that we're talking about are very deserving of getting help and often we have nowhere to turn to to get them that help mm -hmm. and so um, you know there are state funds for treatment but not everybody can be treated and because they even quit, they used to do waiting lists long ago, and they finally quit doing it because they didn't want to create this um, illusion that people were eventually going to be able to get help. Because they were, ne you know, when you're number 2,000, um, you're probably not going to get help. So they stopped, they even stopped doing waiting lists. So we don't know what the need is. Which is another reason why we developed our CTP Recovery Wellness Program yes. to help our residents thrive. In, in recovery to empower them and to and you know we do things that they can learn to love and to yes. enjoy so that they can feel good about their recovery and yes. getting better and like and you so, said Don mm -hmm. the approach is we are open-minded and we've released uh, the um, the cookie cutter approach. Our approach is completely bio-individual. Mm -hmm. We support any pathway in recovery mm -hmm. and uh, we work with each resident that chooses to be part of the program um, to develop their own unique plan. It's a peer-based recovery guided program. 
um, where we offer nutritional stress management and lifestyle support. Mm -hmm. Walk along with them through their journey to help them release old behaviors and thought patterns. Invite in new ones, develop strategies and then tactics um, to again help them thrive in recovery. Mm -hmm. Well, you know this is this has been wonderful. We're coming to a close. Uh, is there anything quickly any one of you would like to say before we? Um, well, we can't do this alone, so join with us. Um, definitely want to um, work together with people in the community um, around the naloxone issue, hopefully around the um, good, good SAM issue too, because that's a key piece that we need as well. So there's things that we can do locally. Um, one of the things that I would like to see, I know from my own experience, is a, su is a support group that is specifically dealing with parents who've lost children because um, that is such a, um, it's a difficult experience to take to other bereavement groups because, you know, you're sitting there, you're, you know, and people have this perception that your child did an act that they chose to do and they died. And you're there with someone who lost their child to an auto accident or cancer or something in it. Nobody says anything, but you just feel it. And so I think that one of the key things that I would like to see is coming together, parents coming together and being a part of this. Because that, you know, and take that passion that we have, because we know what that pain is, and have our, um, and, and to ha we have that passion, but then to use it in a way that's going to make our community better and save lives so others don't have to join our little club that, um, that we don't want people to have to join. So. Well, you know I have a big mouth and I can go on and on and on. I'd like to concede to our other guests because we are short on time. Well, thank you, Don. I think as an extension of what Melanie um, has just said, I encourage everyone to uh, follow us on Facebook at Idaho Voices in Recovery. You can follow us also on Twitter at CTP Recover Well. Um, also, Farm D Phil. You can follow Phil uh, on Twitter, and um, uh, also go to ConnectThePieces.org uh, to, to stay up to date on what we're doing. Uh, let's join together locally in the Boise community. We'll keep you up to date on what's happening on the state level and also a federal level. Also, we uh, love to collaborate with other organizations. I think we have collaborated with you, Pam. Boise Ignite is another local organization um, that is, supports any pathway to recovery and is very active in our community. So get in touch with us. We're here for you. We'd love to come together and um, reduce the stigma, actually to end the stigma mm -hmm. and keep the conversation uh, alive. If, uh, we cannot be silenced. If uh, somebody in the audience is interested in learning more about Fed Up, Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Don. Please, uh, the rally is upcoming on September 28th. Um, if you can attend, you can still be part of the process. You can help by spreading awareness. Um, go to fedupralley.org. Uh, go to Fed Up Rally on Facebook um, to um, share information, to become informed, to become part of the process. Uh, if, you, if you're unable to go to D.C., that's okay. You can still be part of the process. Okay. Thank you very much. And if you have any... Uh questions for Don, his, his phone number is on listed on our uh, sponsorship when you watch the show, unless you have the number, do you know your... It's on there, and on that's there. good. Sure. You can look up Bull Creek and... Uh, can I mention one more thing, Pam? Yeah, I'm sorry, perfect. I didn't want to let this go without mentioning that we do hold um, recovery wellness workshops, holistic mm -hmm. nutrition workshops, the oh, fourth nice. Sunday of every month at the Cathedral of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's open currently to veterans and families uh, and their families in recovery. But we will be expanding our program and we won't turn anyone away that would okay. show up and be interested in receiving our message. So you right. heard that, get involved. <laughs> and let's and not forget the bright side of addiction is recovery. Yes, yes. recovery and there's yes. hope. And yes. We are making a difference. Yes. Yes, thank you. If any of you guys run for office, I'm voting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I want to thank our viewers for joining me today on this show. And if you're interested, you can join me on Time to Heal on Facebook. 
and watch my shows on YouTube. I want to give a special thanks to Ricky Burt for using his song, Broken is a Place. Thank you, Ricky. You can also see his band play at the Fed Up Rally. And my daughter, Jennifer, for the use of her song, Liberation. And also a special thanks to Hamilton Lewis and his band for the use of his song, which will be played at the end of this show. Remember, not everyone gets everything back, as said in his song, but most of us do. But what is the most important thing that you'll get back in recovery is a relationship with God that will stand be with any problem that you may have to face. I just want to end by saying something of my own personal opinion. It's been proven since 1972 that change in the laws has done very little good, except for helping the addict and the alcoholic. However, solving the addiction problem does come from applying an outside solution for an inside problem. What has been proven to help out addicts and alcoholics is one addict talking to another and one alcoholic talking to each other, sharing their experience, strength, and hope, not by just passing it on, but by becoming willing to get out of themselves and become willing to help another addict. Bill W. said to Dr. Bob, he was quoted in his little movie there, I'm not here to help you, I'm here to help me. We do not fix anyone. We do not have that type of power. The 12-step program is the only place where an addict or an alcoholic will go seeking help. And we tell them, we can't help you. Only God could and would if sought. So this Sunday, August 10th, I'll have 35 years, one awesome. day at a time. And my son wanted, I mean my son, my husband wanted to buy me a 30 year chip and I said, no way. I only want a 24 hour chip and that's what I carry with me. I don't do 35 years. I do one day at a time, because they placed bets on me and they said I was never gonna make it. So, <laughs> oh, I wonder. You, know, it's really you can make them that. buy you dinner. Yeah. They can. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do this together, one day at a time. Anything's possible. And I hope, again, that you'll join up with these two ladies and support their cause and help us stop this terrible opiate epidemic that we're experiencing. <sighs> And again, uh, Tim Ryan, our heart is with you, yes. and uh, with yes, you and your loss, and all of you that have lost someone to this terrible addiction problem that we are facing today. Don't give up, because your miracle is on its way. <laughs> My name is Hamilton Loomis. This is the Hamilton Loomis Band. We're all the way from Texas. It's good to be back in Germany. Always took for granted. My life was complete. How could I foresee it could happen to me? Without a safety net, no backup plan. I'm gonna get my dust back in a row. Never the fool again. I was so careless, delicious, simple way. But you returned, and now I learned everything's okay. I lost everything I had, but I got it back. Ooh, 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 I got it back. I lost everything I had. 
Thank y'all so very much. Thank you. What is that? What's been coming from above? Things don't just fall out of the sky. What do you think we're gonna do with him? Think we'll get in trouble? For what we found? I don't think so.